Well, good afternoon and welcome to our second to last Tech Talk at the 2017 Mid-Amp Show. My name is Fred Andersky and I'm the Director of Customer Solutions at Bendix Commercial Vehicle Systems. And what I'm here to talk to you about today is drivers and the autonomy, autonomous future, or future autonomy. And, you know, this wasn't my idea, so if this doesn't work, don't blame me. But you guys all drivers here? Everyone here a driver? Well, if you're a driver, the future is so bright, I had to wear shades. Okay, yeah. I told, I, I told you, James, that wouldn't work. But I got to admit, I do like the shades. They're pretty good. But what we really want to talk about is, you know, there's been a lot of hype about automated autonomous vehicles in the future. And, you know, there are people who are out claiming, oh, we're not going to need drivers in five years, or we're not going to need drivers. So I want to tell you, I'm not buying that. And I don't think that's going to be the case. In fact, I do think the future for drivers is very bright. And when you think about it, you know, there's 3.5 million truck drivers out there, and then there are millions of other drivers out there, okay? There's a real need for drivers, and in fact, I'm one as well. I have my Class A CDL, and if you see some of the videos around, you might see me driving the truck and talking about the technology. But what I do think is really gonna happen is that we're going to continue to grow from a technology standpoint, which is gonna make great opportunities for drivers. So, why do I feel this way? No, I'm not the only Luddite in the room, okay? The reality is that, first of all, demonstration is not commercialization, okay? You know, a demo is a very controlled event. Everybody see that uh, Budweiser truck uh, that drove in Colorado autonomously? The video that they show is really beautiful. You know, it's a bright day, cars driving around, nice Budweiser truck. Reality is, is when they actually did the run, they did it at night, like from about two to four in the morning, and they did it with four or five Colorado State Trooper cars all around the truck, okay? Number two, so when you do a demo, you control a lot of the variables. You can control you know, the weather. Hey, if it's a rainy day, we're not gonna do it. If, it is, if the road's not right, we're not gonna do it. If the lines aren't clear, we're not gonna do it. Um, but when you go into the real world, you can't control the variables, okay? So from demonstration to commercialization takes a lot longer than people realize. So demonstration is not commercialization. Also too, Anyone, everyone know what this is? It's a horse, right? It is a horse. Does it look like a horse? Yes. I worked really hard on this, okay? So it's about the best horse I could do. But the reality is, is what a lot of these folks are talking about when they talk about autonomous cars, they're really one-trick ponies, okay? And the reason why they're one-trick ponies is what they're working on is one application for autonomous driving. And that one application is to drive the truck on, the, on a freeway or an interstate. That's the best environment you can have to start with in any type of autonomy. Now, you're still gonna need a driver to get the truck from the distribution center to the freeway, and then you're gonna need to get the driver from the truck, or from the freeway to the distribution center. Oh, and guess what? If it starts to rain, or if there's a traffic jam or something along those lines, you're probably going to need the driver to get the vehicle onto a different route to make it to the distribution center on time. So it's an easy application to work on, and what it really becomes is adaptive cruise control with steering, all right? And nobody's gonna pay $50,000 for adaptive cruise control without steering, because fleets demand, and you guys demand as drivers, or owner operators, a return on the investment that you're putting into the vehicle, okay? We'll talk a little bit about the automated uh, autonomous ecosystem shortly, but you have to remember that while technology can be developed in a vacuum, technology cannot be deployed in a vacuum. So there's a lot more that goes into the automated autonomous future than just the technology, so we'll talk about that. 
But let's spend a little couple minutes talking about inf infrastructure. Hey, did everybody see the uh, ATA truck up at the White House um, yesterday? And you know the two messages that were coming out uh, from that meeting really tied to the importance of drivers from a long-term future and the importance of the infrastructure. Because you know that's the bread and butter. That's how we get from A to B. Uh, and if it's not in good shape, it makes it more difficult for us to do our jobs. But the problem with the infrastructure is it needs a lot of help. Just the infrastructure we have right now needs a lot of help. I mean, they're talking about a trillion dollars. Okay, a trillion dollars, that's a lot of zeros, you know? I'd be happy with one-tenth of that in terms of my salary. Hint, hint, uh, nobody's ever around when you, when you wanna talk about things like that. But money and time, it's gonna take time to build it. And the other thing is we need to add to the infrastructure to truly get to an automated autonomous future. Vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure, the connected environment around trucking has to happen. And the only way that's gonna happen is by laying lots of cable with transmitters and such over the four million miles of highway and roadways we have in this country. We also have to map all those because an automated autonomous vehicle, you guys have all seen the Google car, right? Runs around, really looks neat, doesn't it? That's because they have real precise maps of Mountain View, California. Now try to take that car and go visit grandma in Denver and just get in the car and say, hey, I wanna go visit grandma in Denver. Well, it'll get you probably to the freeway in Mountain View and then it's gonna say, hey, you gotta take over because we have no maps from here to Denver. So that has to take in place. So all this has to be done to even get the infrastructure in place to start moving forward from that perspective. And then, of course, there's our old friend, Mother Nature. Ever notice how all these tests are done on sunny roads, sunny days, roads nice and clear? Hey, the lines are really bright, okay? There's a reason for that. The reason for it is Mother Nature screws up autonomous vehicles really easily. If it rains or if it snows and the lines are covered up, it creates a problem. And in fact, the New York Times had an article um, that talked about the five things that give autonomous technology a headache, okay? First is the weather, as we had talked about. Number two is detours, okay? Autonomous vehicles have a real problem when all of a sudden the road they think they're going to the proper rump is, is that you need to take a detour. You ever see that with your GP, GPS system? You know, when you decide to go a different route because you know better, isn't that voice pretty nasty to you? You know, no, no, get back here, make the U-turn, get back, yeah, no, and that's the problem. Um, also, too, when it comes to making tough decisions, believe it or not, we as humans, we're a lot better than systems when it comes to needing to make a quick decision on something. Do we hit the car? Do we hit, uh, swerve around it? Do we do something? It takes machines a little bit too intelligent. Difficult choices, number three. Door one, two, or three. You guys remember, let's make a deal. What's behind door number one, number two? Okay, most of you guys are probably too young for that. But the problem is, is the difficult choice because this is really the kill or be killed question. You know, kid runs into the road, the system has to decide, am I going to hit the kid or am I gonna hit the telephone pole and kill the driver inside? That's a very difficult choice, if that's the only choice. We as humans can actually think of other things like, you know, I can, the kid's going this way, I'll swerve that way and avoid both. That's really powerful. And this is one of my favorites. We have talked about mother nature, but call them road spots, okay? Yes, these are supposed to be spots. The problem that automated technologies have with road spots is they don't know if it's a puddle. They don't know if it's an oil spot. They don't know if it's a pothole or a sinkhole, okay? So if it's an oil spot or a puddle, you might just wanna go through it. If it's a pothole, or if you're in Florida or California, a sinkhole, you probably wanna find your way around it. They have problems identifying that. And then the last thing is lines, okay? Again. 
sunny days, nice bright lines, because the systems need to look at the lines to see where they're going. If there is snow, or if there is rain or pooled water, they lose sight of the lines and it has to come back to the driver. So the demonstrations that we see on the automated technologies are really cool, and I'm not trying to, to say that we're not going to get forward faster in the future, but the reality is it's gonna take a lot more time. And that's why we see the technology approach as really evolution, not revolution. What's gonna happen in the future Oops, before I get to that, let's talk about that ecosystem really quick. You know, we talked about the idea that developing technology and deploying technology, you don't want to do it in a vacuum. And there's a really important reason for that in terms of deployment. First of all, you need somebody to buy this technology. And you're not going to buy technology that you don't feel you need unless it's going to help you do your job better. And that's one of the reasons why the customer is going to look for an ROI. $50,000 to have a fancy cruise control system, not a good ROI. But at some point, that is going to get to a point it'll be better. Also important, industries evolving, okay? Um, we're not just the trucking industry anymore. We're the getting, package, getting a package from point A to point B. There's a variety of ways that can do it that are efficient as well. Our competition's changing. Who would have thought Amazon, you know, five years ago would have a ton of warehouses and be running trucks, running their own fleet, okay? That's how the evolution is changing. But there's also other factors. Society, you know, how many of you guys would feel comfortable driving your truck and looking over into the 80,000 pound vehicle next to you and there's no driver there, all right? I know I wouldn't, okay? And there's also the fact that, you know, I like to drive. I have a 2014 Mustang GT. You think I want that thing to be autonomous? No, it's not gonna happen. So we're gonna have this constant struggle between drivers um, and those who just want to cruise. And when you have that two combination going on at the same time, you have potential for trouble. And so that acceptance, and the acceptance, I think, has to start in the auto industry. Why? The auto industry builds 15 million cars a year. You know how many new trucks we build a year in our country? About 300,000 class six, seven, and eight air brake vehicles, most of those being class eight. So for the technology to get to an economical point, we've got to get it on more vehicles, okay? And then safety. Everyone here has heard about the uh, Tesla autopilot. By the way, if there's ever a system you want to buy and it's called autopilot, no, nothing against Tesla, but autopilot is a really bad name for something that's not truly an autopilot, okay? And again, it's a cruise control with steering system. So safety it becomes very critical from that perspective. And so as we talk about the idea of evolving uh, the technology, what we really see are things like, um, for example, collision mitigation technology. We have two products, a radar-based system and um, a camera and radar-based system. I'm gonna talk a little bit about Fusion, and I'm not trying to sell it to you, but what I'm trying to explain about it is the idea of a camera and a radar working together. So what does that mean? When you, let me ask you this. When you make a decision, isn't it better to have more than one source of information? Right? I think so. And that's exactly what the camera and radar is working, working together does. You're able to cross-check the information, verify we have a situation sooner, react earlier with braking and alerting the driver as necessary, and it allows you to take more potential energy, uh, maybe even mitigate a crash or take the potential energy out of a crash that might occur. As we move forward in terms of technology, we're gonna see more of this idea of information into the system from sensors and such on the vehicle, as well as information coming in from outside the vehicle. I mentioned the vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure, the connected environment, that's gonna be important, as well as other pieces of information from cars, from the infrastructure, uh, from, the, uh, 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 from the GPS, from such, from that perspective. All that gets together 
to work, but it doesn't mean that it's a replacement for drivers. So when we take a look at our roadmap going forward, we see drivers as still a key part of it. We have driver assistance today, systems today. In the future, next five or so years, we'll see more advanced driver assistance systems. We'll see platooning with drivers on the road happen. Uh, we'll see more collision mitigation, more advanced collision mitigation to help out. And then in the future, and this goes way beyond just 2021, we'll see things like autonomous yard maneuvering. If you get a chance to see one of our videos, we actually show it, where the driver is able to bring the truck to, uh, uh, to uh, their destination, turn it over to a yard manager, go in and take their break, while the truck automatically or autonomously drives to the dock, backs in, and gets unloaded, comes back up, alerts the driver, driver hops in, continues on his way. Things like the highway pilot application, everyone saw the great uh, Daimler video of the going down the roadway type of thing with the steering uh, and the uh, control, again, the, the cruise control with steering type of thing. That'll be there, but again, it's still gonna need a driver uh, to help take over. And as we move forward, it gets more and more um, exciting, but it's built on driver assistance systems. So let me ask you this question. How many people here think we will see true driverless trucks before 2030? Anyone? How many people think it'll happen after 2050? Okay. How many think it'll be never happen? Good. We did a survey with our sales guys at our sales meeting. All right. We did a survey with our uh, sales guys at our sales meeting, and we asked them, because these guys are dealing with fleets and owner operators on a daily basis, when do you think your fleet will expect to see 50% of the vehicles on the road be driverless? You know what the answer was? Between now and never, and everything in between. All right? So there's a lot of doubt as to when that happens. But as we go, and that's why we call it automated driving, because automation means there's still a human involved. Autonomous means no human involved at all. That's why we see the future is automated driving. And the technologies get better that help the fleets, help the driver and the owner operator, uh, and help society overall to have a better, happier, safer, more effective, more efficient future.